How does a movie with a terrible 48% critical rating and only an above average 73% audience rating go on to spawn a massive television franchise with four spin-offs over 17 seasons, books, comic books, video games, toys, as well as two direct-to-DVD movies, an animated series, and a unique streaming service where millions of fans can immerse themselves in that universe whenever they want. Of course, we are talking about the science fiction phenomenon known as Stargate. It's been almost 25 years since Stargate hit theaters to those mixed reviews and has since built an army of fans. ScreenRant.com lists Stargate as the eighth greatest science fiction franchise of all time behind Star Trek, Star Wars, The Outer Limits, The Twilight Zone, Doctor Who, Battlestar Galactica, and Planet of the Apes. Others argue that Stargate should be considered even higher and closer to those other franchises with the word star in them. Regardless of where the franchise lands in history, the real story is the unlikeliness that it sits where it does now only 25 years after it was born. But to find out, we have to travel back to the beginning and find out where Stargate started. Written by Dean Devlin and Roland Emmerich, Stargate hit theaters October 28, 1994. Critics may have written off the movie, but fans enjoyed it. The film grossed more than $71 million in the United States, and almost double that overseas for a whopping $200 million worldwide. Stargate set the record for the highest grossing opening weekend for a film released in the month of October. Even though Stargate exceeded studio expectations, it was still only the 17th most successful film of 1994, falling behind blockbusters like Forrest Gump, The Lion King, and True Lies. It wasn't even the most successful science fiction movie. It was edged out by Star Trek Generations, which famously had both Kirk and Picard in the same movie together. But despite being number 17, there was something special about Stargate that people couldn't quite put their finger on. Stargate leaves you with a feeling for an untapped potential and a universe that has more questions than answers. And the movie may have even qualified as a blockbuster in 1994 had it not been cut short by huge audience films like The Santa Claus, Interview with a Vampire, and Generations, which hit theaters right on its heels. Despite these disadvantages, Stargate lingered in the mind of science fiction fans. Where else could those hieroglyphics take us in the cosmos? That is an answer we might have never known had it not been for a couple of guys working for MGM on a show called The Outer Limits. But let's get back to that in a moment. First, where did Devlin and Emmerich get the idea for a Stargate or wormhole that uses constellations as spatial coordinates to connect instantaneously to a distant planet? Some people point to the 1982 book by Pauline Gedge or the 1976 novel by Stephen Robinette. Both were titled Stargate. Or how about the 1958 Stargate book by Andre Norton, where a group of people pass through a Stargate and take refuge in a new world? Sound familiar? While it's not clear for certain where the origin of the story comes from, Devlin and Emmerich were sued in 1995 by Omar Zadi, a Shawnee Oklahoma high school teacher who claimed they stole the idea from his manuscript titled Egyptscape, which Zadi had claimed he submitted to 20th Century Fox and they had rejected it in 1984. His suit alleged that Studio Canal eventually acquired a copy of this manuscript and hired Devlin and Emmerich to make Stargate using Zadie's ideas. He sued everyone, including MGM, for $140 million, which was the film's estimated profit. In 1996, U.S. District Judge Robin Calthron ruled the movie Stargate to be substantially similar to Zadie's manuscript. The judge said the main characters in both works were similar in number and roles, and the lead character in each story is involved in a time travel project. The judge also said both works proceed in a similar sequence, and the pace followed in both the movie and in the manuscript have common elements. Calthron ruled that ordinary reasonable people could conclude that the total concept and feel of both the film and the manuscript exhibit a substantial similarity of expression. With a ruling that seemed to lean heavily in Zadie's favor, the case was set to go to a jury for the decision. Before that could happen, Zadie settled out of court for a reported $50,000, which was a tiny fraction of the $140 million he was suing for. 
Some would claim his decision to settle, despite the judge's favorable ruling, was a result of a change to copyright laws in 1989. Before 1989, if you wanted to prove you owned a creative work, you would apply for a copyright notice. This change made copyright notices optional, and instead all works were automatically copywritten at the time of their creation. While the new law does protect more creators, the problem with this, as Title 17 of the U.S. Code suggests, is by not having an official copyright notice, it may reduce the amount of damages someone would receive in an infringement lawsuit. While the details of the settlement are unknown, it's possible that this change in the law may have motivated Zadi to settle as opposed to fighting a long court battle and possibly get nothing. And while there is no definitive answer where the idea for Stargate came from, in the end, it is the vision of Devlin and Emmerich that we see on the big screen. And even better news for the Stargate creators is that a financially successful movie is a potential franchise in the making. But before the duo could come back to make another Stargate movie, their success had landed them the 1996 blockbuster movie Independence Day, starring Will Smith and Jeff Goldblum. According to Devlin and Emmerich, it was their intention to come back and make two more Stargate movies. But as we'll find out, that would turn out to be a lot more difficult than they would know. It was during their huge success on Independence Day that unbeknownst to them, Studio Canal a French film production and distribution company, sold the television rights for Stargate to MGM without discussing it with the creators. Devlin and Emmerich would later voice their displeasure at this turn of events, but would go on to make films like 1998's Godzilla, The Patriot, The Day After Tomorrow, and 2012. This wasn't the end of Devlin and Emmerich with Stargate, but more on that later. Remember those guys we were talking about at MGM who were working on The Outer Limits? They were two of the many people who went to see Stargate in theaters and couldn't get it out of their heads. There had to be more to this universe, they thought. Brad Wright and Jonathan Glasner were in the middle of The Outer Limits season two. Despite working together, neither of them knew the role they were about to play in the legacy that would become Stargate. The Outer Limits was already a success and both men were co-producers on the show. But Glasner was from Los Angeles and had grown tired of Vancouver, Canada, where the show was being made. He wanted to go home. MGM, not wanting to risk the show, asked Glasner what would it take to get him to stay. Thinking it was a long shot and would never happen, Glasner told MGM that they had this movie that would be better as a TV series. He said, if you let me do Stargate as a series, I'd be willing to stay. The president of MGM, John Symes, who didn't seem to have any plans for the newly purchased television property, said he didn't think it could happen, but let me look into it. Little did Glasner know, his partner Wright had also asked the studio about doing a Stargate series. It was these two independent moves from a couple of guys who were already making a great series that likely allowed MGM to pull the trigger. MGM had two things they wanted. First, they had to agree to work on it together. And second, they had to keep making The Outer Limits while creating the Stargate series. Luckily for the rest of the world, both men were up to the challenge. Wright and Glasner spent three months studying the movie and figuring out all of the mechanics of the Stargate itself. The gate had 39 symbols on it, and it took seven symbols to go to Abydos. Glasner wondered, where would the other symbols take people? Part of Wright's original pitch was that the show should have a sense of the early NASA program. The teams going through the gates would be explorers, like the early astronauts, and would be outmatched and outgunned by aliens. One of the things Glasner and Wright were aware of is they didn't want to be doing Star Trek. The show was set in the present and not the future, so the characters would be limited by the technology and knowledge that they currently possessed. They would be discovering everything with the audience as opposed to having scanners that told them what was happening. It made everything the characters faced more dangerous, and as a result meant higher consequences, which would keep fans on the edge of their seats. And if you're going to have a compelling show, you need a great cast. They knew they wanted to have Daniel Jackson and Jack O'Neill back on the show to keep that connection with the movie and continue the story. But they knew they needed more characters. So Tilk was created as a way to explain the Goa Uld and the Jaffa, and Glasner was adamant that they needed to have a strong female character, which became Samantha Carter. But which actors would be able to fill the shoes of Kurt Russell and James Spader? John Symes, the president of MGM Television, 
who had greenlit the show and was also responsible for coming up with the name SG-1, had an idea. There was an actor he knew that would be perfect for the role. It was someone he had a relationship with when he was over at Paramount, working on a little show called MacGyver. <laughs> Thanks for watching part one of the definitive history of Stargate. If you enjoyed this video, subscribe, like, and hit the notification bell to let us know you want more like it. Chevron 1 locked, Chevron 2 encoded. Click here for part two of the definitive history of Stargate.